Right. Can everyone hear? Okay. Um, so, first off, I want to sincerely thank Kazutaka san for inviting me to speak today. I'm honored to be back here um, and very grateful for the opportunity to talk about the Cassandra because it's one of my favorite things to do is to sort of go around and talk to people about Cassandra and the project and how, how awesome I think it's great. Um, my name's Nate, uh, CK of Last Pickle. Um, I'm Patrick Sander Committer, and I'm the PMC chair for the project currently. Um, you can find me on Twitter, follow me. Uh, any questions you have, feel free to email me afterwards. Um, and here's our agenda today. There's four things we're going to talk about. Um, what, what I think is most important with the project right now is community, um, the status of the project itself, um, what we're doing with Oro and new releases, and, and where we're going after that. Um, so there's been a lot of changes in the past year, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, first, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some personal history I have with uh, visiting Japan. Um, it was almost exactly seven years ago that I took this picture from Shibuya Station. Um, and I had been invited to speak at this event, the uh, New Sequel Afternoon in Japan, which I think was one of the first presentations of Cassandra in Tokyo. Um, was, was anybody here, was anybody at this event back in 2010? Do you remember this in Rakuten Tower? It was, it was one of my first presentations. Um, this is one of the first events I, I spoke about Cassandra, and there were a lot more people there than I thought there would be. There were about 500 people that sort of went there at the last minute. Um, and I could see even then that there was a very strong community in Japan about people really interested in this new no sequel thing. And it was, it was an exciting place to, it was an exciting time to be there. Um, and it was, it was fun to be there and talk about that event. That, so I'm really I'm grateful to be back here again to talk about Cassandra. Um, so, that's a good segue into how transition to start to talk about community and where we are as an open source community right now. Um, Apache Cassandra obviously is an open source project hosted the Apache Software Foundation. Um, that's pretty straightforward. But there's a lot of other big data projects there, and with all these other big data projects, um, there's usually a vendor behind it, right? There's usually somebody selling you a distribution, selling you support. Um, you see, there's three or four vendors there selling Hadoop uh, distributions, there's um, Spark distributions, there's Kafka distributions, um, Flink, and you know, IBM will say anything, distribution, whatever you want. Um, this can be confusing to new users looking for the easiest way to get started with a project. Um, it's hard on the ecosystem, but it does, is a trade off because these vendors provide resources and access and you know, sponsor people to speak, and they sponsor people to write documentation. So it's a trade-off, but you get these situations where um, this is a new Apache project called Tefra. Um, it's a distributed transaction store on top of Hadoop. Um, and you have these compatibility charts like this where you have to look at, well, am I running Matt Bar? Am I using Cloudera? Am I using Hortonworks? And like this, this is really daunting if you're at a big enterprise. Uh, this, you have to really think about this because you don't have control about what you're deploying and how you're deploying it necessarily. So you may not even be able to use some of these projects depending on what the vendors implement. Um, unfortunately, we're starting to get to the same place in Cassandra. Um, there's open source Apache Cassandra. There's DataStax Enterprise, and there's a there's a variant called Cilia DB, which is a C++ rewrite. Um, I don't know anyone actually using it, but it's there. Um, however. We are in an interesting position with Apache Cassandra that we're pretty much unique in the market. There's no commercial vendor support of the community itself. Um, much like in this picture, we're on, we're on a low road sort of way off in the distance with all by ourselves. Um, well, last year, data stepped back, data stack stepped back from this leadership role in the project, um, took a lot of the resources that they had been put in the community. Um, to focus on proprietary software. That, that's fine. That happens. Like it's natural. I think I see that as like a natural evolution of the market. Um, they're focusing on enterprise solutions with graph databases, and that, that's great. I think that's a, a benefit in the long run, where you have a, a clearly 
really made my between enterprise features that some people you know want one tool to solve everything. Some people want to open source implementation. Um, there's a necessary audience for that, but this has an effect our, on our community. Um, in most recently this past year, it's been I think a lot of it is positive, right? The committers and community participants we have now are all running clusters. Um, everyone that we have really heavily involved are all actually using this in production, which didn't used to be the case. Um, because when you have these vendors with software that they'll sell you a distribution, um, they're basically a software company and they aren't necessarily dog fooding what they're selling. Um, so that's the problem when you know, you're writing software for something, you don't use your own software at scale, particularly when we're talking about distributed systems. You know, you just aren't going to get the same sort of feedback that you would have while developing. Um, <clears throat> our mail list participation is really high. Um, if you ask a question on a mail list, you're going to get some good answers. You're going to get some answers from people that work at Apple or Instagram or you know, Instacluster also is here. They're really active on the mailing list. Um, and there's no corporate message in any of our product communication anymore. It's just, it's just we're an open source project. That's how it is. Um, and there's no external pressure on developing features from the marketing department. So these are all really positive for our community right now. Um, and for the past couple of months, we're starting to see again you know, community events like, like this one, where it's put on by people in the community, it's not put on by a vendor. Um, just last week in San Antonio, we had a NGCC, which is the first <coughs> event about Cassandra since early 2010 that's not been sponsored by a vendor. Um, and I, I think that's important because that shows you how the community has moved on to be self-supporting, self-sustaining. Um, and this is small, it was only 50 people, but it was focused on committers and focused on contributors to the project. And it's one of those things where we talk about research and development, what we're working on internally ourselves for the next couple of years, how um, I'll talk about some of the stuff that came out of this. But I, I think this is a an excellent sign of where we're going as community. We can put on an event like this and sort of feel it out. And I think we'll see more of this going forward, where basically we hold back and take control of ourselves as an open source project. Um, and that you have a, a certain degree of trust there that, you know, as an open source project, we're going to follow the very, you know, open, everything developed in a clear set of guidelines about how we move forward. Um, other community strengths that we have, um, very active mailing lists, or aggressively, our JIRA is getting a lot better. We have one of the cleanest JIRAs in Apache right now in terms of tagging and releasing. Um, a lot of documentation for these past couple of months and continues to improve. And we have really fast turnaround now on serious bugs because our users are using this in production. Our developers are using this in production. So they're focused on that too. Um, some other highlights we've had in the community. Um, Instacluster actually donated a bunch of build resources recently. Um, that's been really helpful. This is a shot of the ASS Jenkins. Um, we actually have 16 build slaves out there in our farm right now, dedicated solely to Cassandra. Um, and this is awesome for Open Source Project. We have some of those, uh, some of the highest number of actually dedicated instances in the Apache infrastructure right now. Um, so that's cool that companies are, are stepping up to donate resources for our infrastructure. Um, to Apache Software Foundation for open source. Um, and I recently got the DTest project, which is our distributed test suite. This used to live at data stacks. Um, and this was a problem because when you wrote a patch to fix something, you had to verify it with a distributed test case. But because this wasn't hosted at Apache, sometimes there'd be a lag of two, three, four days before, before you commit the DTest in conjunction with a patch. And somebody else might have developed something that could create the edge case in your D-test, and it's now hosted at Apache, and that makes it a lot easier to do from a development standpoint. And the overall takeaway is that as an open source project, you don't need a vendor to run Apache Cassandra. The, the community is supportive, the community is there, um, and you know, you can do it, people do. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about sort of the status of the project itself. Um, so, Last, the past two years, we had a TikTok release policy, much like Intel does with their microprocessors. That was a model we did anyway, um, where it was sort of not necessarily clear what we were doing about it. We, you know, we, it was hard to communicate so what that meant in terms of new features versus stability versus long-term release support. 
Um, everyone got confused and, and no one really understood it. <clears throat> so the benefits for that, it's, it's, we've gotten into that by the way the past couple of months, but the benefits of that were you know, a, a really relentless focus on integration testing, longer term support, of existing release. We just released 2119 um, last week, uh, and that's I think three and a half years old. Four years of two one. No, it's, 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 it's we've been supporting that for about three years. So we now we're committed to sort of keeping these releases out longer and making sure they work. Um, and having a green test board before we release anything, making sure the D tests aren't flaky and that all of our unit integration testing is all working. Those, those are all good legacies that came out of TikTok. Um, the bad legacy is that this is what it looks like now to commit a patch to trunk um, to fix an issue if you have to commit to Cassandra 3 and the trunk. Um, you know, two, like initial commit, two different merge commits, um, and potentially patch formats might be different depending on what you're working on and how big the surface area affects. So it is what it is. This isn't going to change for a while, but it's, it's complicated. And it's it's sort of it's hard to get other people involved, new, new developers involved with the project. We have the you know workflow like this, but we can. Um, and so that brings us to the interesting questions like, well, what version should I use? That's a good question. Um, and there's there's some real talk to be had about this. Is that um, Basically, this is the sum of it. The 2.2 and earlier, this low risk, they work really well. There's a lot of really good clusters out there using um, 2.2 and 2.1. Um, 3.0 was supposed to be a stable release of TikTok. Um, I know there's a couple people putting a lot of work into that to make sure it is stable. 3.11 was the 3.x branch, was supposed to be the, the feature branch of the 3 series. But I, I think, you know, as of recently, that that's basically become the new stable. Um, we aren't putting new features in three, so if you're going to focus on three series, I'd say 3.11 as of 3.11.1. Um, and 3.0 uh, will work fine too, but I, yeah. So um, this begs the question, I was like, what about materialized views? Because this was a feature that was um, really what we pushed for 3.0 release, this new storage engine and materialized views. Um, there's a really big, extensive conversation on the developer list thread right now about sort of the scope of this and how badly this is messed up and how we're going to deal with this going forward. Um, but the takeaway for this is that I would, you can make them work, but there's just there's a very narrow, happy path in terms of uh, what they do. Um, if you're looking to use materialized views, I would say it, it's. Do some research on it, do a heck of a lot of testing because, and only if you're not doing any deletes in your use case. Um, otherwise, it'll have a whole host of problems. And as long as problems in distributed systems, it turns out to be extremely complex. Um, and we really only got this feature out there for, um, you know, to support some features in DigitalX Enterprise, which is the original reason why I was committed. Um, and it wasn't really ready to hit. Uh, mainstream. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to protect ourselves from that as a community going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so materialized views, only if you do some research, only if you know exactly what you're doing with it, otherwise skip it and pretend it's not there, unfortunately. Um, so that brings us to what's new in 4L. And this is um, a little bit happier, except for this first side. Uh, the thread is gone. There's no more thread out there. Um, and that, that was a necessary change. There's really not a too not much not too much else to talk about here. Um, the code path was a burden to maintain the storage engine after we changed. Um, it had some features that I think differentiated Cassandra and that still don't necessarily graph that well in the CQL, but it's is what it is and it was done. Um, really the, the exciting set of changes that we have before it was a lot to do around uh, repair. Um, there's been a, a lot of work done. Um, there were 20 bucks fixed specifically having to do with, with all aspects of repair, but particularly um, incremental repair. That just didn't work previously. Um, there's a lot of edge cases for that. You could end up with over streaming and, you know, and any number of other issues that we had. Um, so it, a lot of work's been done on that in the 40 series. Um, we have a host of new metrics available for monitoring the status of repair. Um, you can see repair status on no tool now and how that's affecting uh, 
in visual call panels. Um, and incremental repair actually works consistently now, and is really useful as an enterprise feature. Um, and there's been a, uh, there's a substantial amount of repair logging improvements to tell you. But it's a lot easier to see the state of repair and progress now. Um, so it's easier to track down issues with that. Easier to see how much time it's going to take to do this. This is one of the most important features of Cassandra in terms of maintaining consistency with the database. Um, the next really big feature we have around this is uh, previews of repair. So if you're looking at a note to repair the, the preview, and you can see before you actually do the repair how much data is being exchanged. Um, you have a who there is who's sending data to who, and, and then a what, of like how much data is going to be sent, and the sizes. Um, and that's really super helpful to get an idea of what this looks like to an operator. You may have to do like a big repair and get an idea of how long it's going to take. Um, you now have this preview before you have to run anything to see what the effects are going to be. Um, and now this concept of a pull repair as well, uh, where we can specify minus pull um, from the from host there is um, dot one, the, the, from, the to host is dot one, the from host is dot two. Um, we specify a start token and an end token, and then we actually run the repair, and you can see the who and the what it is a heck of a lot smaller. This is the same repair set as I had on the original slide, where before we were doing you know, four different sets of back and forth with you know, 62 megs. Now we're doing um, two sets, of, essentially one set of back and forth with 10 megs. So you have uh, the ability to pull a specific host from another, and you can do this when you're bringing the node into the cluster for the first time or replacing the node. This becomes a really powerful paradigm to speed up repairs a little bit, taking a long time in the past. Um, so this is a cool feature. Um, and so we also have a, a couple of interesting additions in CQL that might be useful to some people. Um, the concept of timestamp functions though there. So take this simple table. Um, we really, we're caring about the date field here. Um, this is a select to show the data I have in there um, with the partition key. Uh, what we're looking at is the dates there and then on the bottom. I can do a like a Jira style date range there, and that gives me a specific result to look at that. So this is really helpful in a lot of time series use cases from the select side, depending on what you're doing, to actually simplify <coughs> querying and do stuff programmatically. Um, similarly, we have arithmetic functions available. Um, in this case, we're, we're caring about this TS field, which is just an integer field. Um, I'm looking at the, the, the value 10 for this table, and then I have you know, multiplication, modulo, um, a bunch of other arithmetic properties now. Um, and again, it's just a, a syntax, helpful syntax construct <coughs> is useful for a lot of folks. Um, and this is operations that are supported. Um, another note, we actually have documentation in trunk for CQL, and it has been for a while, but this gets built out more and more. Um, it's getting better and better. So that's definitely something to look at. Um, next up in the 4.0 side is uh, an internet messaging rewrite. And these are um, probably one of our biggest features and most useful features in years. And like these are the two commit messages for them when we added this, you know, nine words total <laughs> for two of our biggest features. Um, and if you want to learn about this, you can check out Jason's talk, which is going to be all about this, um, switching to Netty and how excellent that's been in terms of speeding up note to note messaging. Um, so go see that because it's, it's really powerful in terms of 4.0 and how it's going to work. Um, cluster security is going to be a really easier to implement. And every time I give a Cassandra talk, I try to work in a little bit of security because it's sort of a passion of mine. I started my career in security and systems architecture. Um, so it's very important to me. And security is scary. So we start talking about security and you have situations like in the United States where data for 200 million adults gets exposed to, you know, the hackers writ large. And there's, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a scary thing to think about. So I put a nice picture of a cat up here on the computer just to make it cute. It will be easier to digest. Um, and it's really easy to protect to attack a Cassandra cluster that's not been protected. Um, particularly if you have any sort of exposure to the public internet, there's a number of things that you can do um, to really break a cluster and usually steal data. Um, 
So this next slide, I actually totally lie, this cat's actually a world-renowned hacker, and he's gonna go after your cluster. Um, and he realizes that the message format that knows Exchange and Cassandra is a simple byte pack message with no source verification on it. Um, and this is a, it's a feature, not a bug, because we do this to make it easier to add notes for scalability reasons, but it, this makes it super easy to just throw a message at a cluster to do whatever you want. Um, and this is an nmap command for, uh, this IP address is um, US East for Amazon, US East 1. And if you run this nmap command, you'll actually get hits of Cassandra clusters dangling 7,000 off in the world. So that's super scary that people still do this. Um, that command will actually return hits that you could attack. Uh, fun fact number one, it takes a single message on our wire protocol to insert an admin account to the system table if you're using security. This bypasses CQL, this bypasses all the checks of everything. You can just drop a message on the wire if you know the format and away it goes. Similarly, you can, it takes a single message to truncate the table on a wire. So you can do the same thing, byte pack a message format, drop it on the wire, and you just truncate the table. Um, again, the low CQL, the low any other mechanism that's usually out front in the cluster. Um, this one's a good one. This is a, a feature, a little known feature that was originally written to verify new hardware for a Cassandra cluster. You can actually attach a note, a note to the cluster with this value set to get an idea how the new hardware, new configuration is going to perform with the write load. It basically just says to capture a certain amount of writes in process. Um, but you're basically saying capture a certain amount of writes in process with no without providing any sort of visibility for molested cluster that this node is attached. So it's like sticking a, a tick onto your cluster and just sucking an arbitrary amount of data off. Um, it actually is a really scary attack vector if you don't have your cluster secure. Um, and the fix of this is really easy. Note to node encryption and SSL certification work great. Um, with very little impact on performance. So it's easy to add uh, to an existing cluster. And I have a detailed blog post on doing this that I wrote a couple of years ago because it was such a problem. Um, and the bonus is that you can now do this with no downtime because one of the new features in 4.0 that is going to get reviewed, they're going to get patched here any day, it's in the process of reviewing that right now, is uh, Cassandra 10.4.4, which is the ability to manage the Netty connection now thanks to Jason's rewrite with the Netty stream. So we can simultaneously do SSL and non-SSL in the same socket. So you can actually roll out you know, to know SSL with a couple different rolling restarts and have this protected your cluster just over the course of the day after you set everything up. Um, so there's no reason not to secure your cluster. There's no reason not to secure pool 7,000 to prevent yourself from hacker cats who are going to steal all your data. Um, it's really straightforward to set this up. When you're done, it looks like this. Um, you know, the important part here, making sure you use two-way client certificate authentication. Um, otherwise, you're just authenticating the same way a web server and a web client do. That's not helpful to anybody. So that gets us to the point of what comes next. Um, again, we don't have a company driving major features according to marketing requirements. So you know, the, what we decide to work on is all community driven and all driven by needs of our users and what people want to do. Um, one of the history, interesting features that come out of that, uh, and this is a, a feature that's been debated for a while, is the virtual tables. And this is one of those things that's going to, this seems like it should have been there, and it's a really good idea. And if you've used any sort of RDB, RDBMS before, you're kind of used to it. Um, and it looks kind of like this. Don't necessarily look at the query. It's sort of, this was a stub based off of someone's branch that I, that I took a snapshot of. Um, what we care about is being able to see runtime metrics from CQL, which is basically like mental keep size. They can see what's going on with the runtime through CQL layer and be able to monitor it there. Um, like show variables in MySQL and being able to handle that and do the same sort of thing. Um, so that, that's super interesting. It's really useful. It's one of those things that's operator friendly because our developers are mostly now operators. So we're implementing features like this now, um, features that people are going to use. Uh, and this is the two issues if you want to track this, um, 7622, 7622, 9233. Um, 
then that's going to be a pretty interesting new feature for 4.0. Um, so one of the new things that's come out from the NGCC and it's been talked about, you know, it's got a lot of buzz around, it's pluggable storage engine for Cassandra. Um, however, the idea is not new. Um, this presentation was uh, done the same day I was here in 2010. Um, some folks from Tokyo Tech had actually demonstrated Cassandra running MySQL as a storage engine, and Cassandra is sort of the network and replication model, and they had, and they had actually a working prototype with this and did a presentation on it. I thought it was really neat. And I asked them to submit a ticket uh, after I talked to them about it, and they eventually did. They cleaned the code and submitted it as $29.95. Um, and it never went anywhere. And I, I hate to say it, but I think a lot of the pushback initially, I was still working for data stacks at the time, um, a lot of pushback was that nobody wanted to support one in one storage engine format, despite all the benefits that this would have had in terms of like encapsulation, like software encapsulation would make it a lot easier to stub out a lot of our storage infrastructure, to stub out our storage tests. Um, and that, that got passed up. And you, know, you get to actually see the conversation on 2995 and some of the original details. And it was, it was disappointing because it was actually a really neat feature. Um, and I, I thought it, it would have been a good addition to the project. Um, so what's been proposed recently is to integrate RocksDB from Facebook's uh, storage engine, or Facebook database with Cassandra. Um, and you know, I had to add this to the slide because I like the original MySQL one. So, um, and I, I want to say a quick thanks to one of our committers, Doug Hong, and the rest of his team on Instagram who put this together. He gave me permission to use his slides from last week at NGCC, but just as they were. Um, so with this proof of concept, what they did was they took RocksDB and implemented um, the storage engine as this, added some pluggability layers to the storage engine and sort of hacked in the way RocksDB to work through JNI calls to, I guess, RocksDB C++ based. Um, for a specific use case they had, which is very like sort of old school Cassandra, but more like key value pair. Um, and they were, they were having problems with uh, GC stalls in terms of trying to tune Cassandra with this. Um, and this is their original graph before they did the integration with um, stall times. You can see uh, percentages were you know, up around 2.5% of the time is spent wait for GC cycles. Um, and that's, that's a big deal for somebody like Instagram because you know they live or die on the ability to satisfy our requests as quickly as possible for a large number of users. Um, Relatency before was the same picture. It's like you had these transient spikes as they're dealing with um, GC load for a couple of their, their, their workloads and the way they have their data model, their main metadata store set up. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, they did a lot of, so they had the impetus to fix this because when you're dealing with thousands of servers, if you can knock some of that time off, that's, that's real money savings, right? And you can turn off a couple of things at that scale. It's really important. Um, so after putting this prototype in the water, what they saw is uh, GC times is a 6x improvement from 40 mil, between 40 milliseconds and 10 milliseconds, originally from uh, 2.5 to 1.5%. So um, success faster on on GC times and I'm sorry, read latency, and then 10x faster on GC stall times. So just with, with moving storage around and offloading that workload to the C based storage, and we take a lot of the GC heap thrashing that we have in our repad out for this specific workload, the key value pair workload, and is just a substantial performance improvement. Um, you know, this isn't a panacea. There's some major challenges there with streaming and how uh, range fleets are going to work also. Um, this big surface area of changes and those patches are really hard to do in an active open source project. So you have to coordinate a lot of people who are working on other things. Um, the key word there is the prototype, right? What, what it is a prototype is by no means ready to, it, it, one, include it to the code base or even put out into production. Um, so they wrote it for a very narrow use case of what they're doing. Um, but I, nevertheless, I think it represents some really interesting future mechanics on what's going to happen and where we're going as a project. Because this was this, some features that came out of the community, you know, for a community, and was written by developers who are running 
you know, thousand new clusters. And so we're going to see more and more of this going forward is that the features that we do write are going to be written by need, they're going to be written by people who are actually using them, and they're going to be awesome because of them. Um, and here, the ticket numbers, if you want to follow this, then I, I suggest you do because it's, it's going to be some interesting work done. Um, there's already a lot of debate on this. Some people really don't like it, some people really do. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, another thing that we're going to do more of in the future is, is turning off features by default when we first build them. Um, and we, we see this now with uh, materialized views in the next 3.11.1 and 3.0.15 uh, releases. We're actually going to turn off a feature in materialized views that's been incredibly bug laden and just basically doesn't work is when you put uh, a non-primary key call in the filtering of the materialized view. We're actually taking that ability off so new users can't do it. You have to actually explicitly add this. Um, and you're going to see more of this in the future for other features that we add. Is these things are going to be off by default because this occurred to us, uh, and there's still a raging debate right now about how we're going to do this and what the appropriateness, the appropriateness of this. Um, will we do it for each feature, will we do it for major impacting ones. Um, and the goal here is just to protect new users from these features that you know, have only been vetted on a narrow set of use cases, but to try to minimize the impact until we know they're safe because we're going to be running them in production before you run them in direct production because, well, again, this is coming out of the community. It's not coming to satisfy like a market requirement that nobody really knows about. This is coming from an open source community to satisfy your need. But we're going to make sure it's safe for everybody um, before we turn these things on going forward. And the, again, this is under debate right now about how we're going to do that and what the criteria for that is going to be. So we'll see. But it's one of those things that, just to show you, that we, we care about being stable. We care about making sure that what we do is well understood by users and it's clear what's going on. Um, and along those lines, one of the biggest things we're going for is that, you know, we're running clusters, uh, other developers are running clusters, is that we're, we're running these things, we're testing them with real workloads, with real situations, um, more so than you would have had in the past because all our developers are power users, and sometimes they're very big power users. Um, and I think Jason talks a little bit about this in his presentation, but at, at Apple, they are very careful about how they test their features going forward. So you're going to see a lot of these features being vetted by really large users before you know, they make it to you because we want to use them and we want them to work on our clusters so we're not going to just throw them to you and hope they work and let you report bugs. They're actually, we're actually going to vet these things a lot better going forward. Um, and, and my goal is sort of being involved in this project is to make sure that this is like the state of Cassandra operators in the future. They, 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 I want everybody to be bored running Cassandra clusters. I want I want you to feel like this because I want it to work. Um, I want it, want it to be the basis of a lot of big data infrastructure, which we're starting to see now. Um, one of the some of the first plugins developed some like the exciting new projects in Apache right now, like Apache Beam, and Apache Flink. Some of the the better working plugins are all you know the Cassandra data syncs and the Cassandra I/O integration. Um, everyone sees this now as basically like a default de facto storage engine for big data projects, and that's exactly what I want to be. Is that I want us to be what you turn to when you have to store a lot of data. Um, I want us to be like the distributed database in the ecosystem. So we do that by being born. And the more we vet these features for you, the more we, as developers, test these features with our infrastructure before getting them out to you, the more. It's going to, your job's going to be boring, which is a good thing going forward because you don't want those experimental features to bite you <coughs> and have that be something that breaks your cluster. Um, and with that, I'm um, going to wrap it up. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to talk to me. Um, I can go into deep detail on any, any of the stuff that I've talked about, or we can talk about something else. I'm happy to do troubleshooting with people, et cetera. I'm here for the whole day, so please feel free to come by and introduce yourselves. Thanks.